very much and thank you for all of you who woke up so early after the party. Uh, this is not trivial, I guess. Uh, this is my first time that I'm speaking in J-Focus, so I'm a bit excited. Hope it will not have any effect, negative effect on my talk or negative effect on Kotlin. So when I first submitted the talk a few months ago, uh, we have been using Kotlin for five years in my company. And then COVID came and Omicron variant and the, and, the, and the conference was postponed to May. So I am happy to say that it is now six years of experience with Kotlin. So you got 20% more for the same price. This is me. My name is Chaim. Uh, it's, I know it's a bit hard to pronounce. I've been doing software development since I was 12. My first computer was Commodore 64. And I've started developing in BASIC, later Pascal. And in my professional life, I've been developing in C and C++. And in 2003, I started developing in Java. In the last uh, six years, I'm doing development in Kotlin, in Next Insurance. And... Uh, <coughs> Besides that, I've been a developer, an architect, engineering manager, and uh, on top of that, I'm one of the organizers of Java IL, which is the Java uh, user community in Israel, and also recently a Java champion. On my personal life, I have two daughters, a wife, and a dog named Mushu, after the sidekick in the first movie of Mulan, which was unfortunately removed in the second movie that Disney made, which means not always version two is better than version one. Okay, lesson for life. A bit about Next Insurance. It is an uh, insurtech company startup started six years ago, and it's aimed to disrupt and become the market leader of the small business insurance of. Uh, in the US. It's a very big market and very frustrating to get insurance because if you're a small business and you want to start working, you need to contact an agent. And Next Insurance enables you to get insurance online very easily and very clearly. And in five minutes, you can get insurance and start get working. We started six years ago, seven employees. Uh, I was the first backend developer. And right now, the company has 1,000 employees and um, over $4, and $4 billion valuation on the latest round. We are based in Palo Alto, and, in, uh, and uh, our engineering is in Krasava in Israel. And um, I'm going to tell you actually the story of how we started to use uh, Kotlin in Next Insurance. And why we continue to do so, and what are the introspection that we have on this language and its language feature. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Kotlin? Okay, that's good. Because I'm not going to do one-on-one -on -one tutorial of Kotlin. So the first step is going to present to you the rationale and how we make the decision six years ago. And the second part is going to be discussing five features of Kotlin and what we find nice about them, where we are, are the caveats in them. And the last one, I'm, and if I have time, we talk about migration. So I am a Java developer for many years. Uh, I've also been like uh, seven years a performance expert and consultant helping organizations solve GC problems, uh, synchronizations, uh, performance issues. And I was feeling very comfortable with the JVM and with the capabilities that it, it can give to large-scale software development. So it was, ver was very clear for me as the first backend developer of the company that a JVM language is going to be used in our project. And I actually started developing in Java. But uh, two weeks later, I, after I started, I was starting to ask myself, Maybe I can find a better alternative. And the ecosystems of languages back then looked like this. There was also Ceylon, uh, which was a project by Red Hat, which I was, it was looking too risky, so I kept it aside. I am a strongly typed guy. I don't like when 
the typing system is not helping you do the job, so Groovy, Clojure, and JRuby were out of the question. I had some very weird experiences with Scala in the past. Uh, personally, I think that I'm not smart enough to develop in Scala. And Kotlin was looking like a very compelling uh, um, option. So I was um, starting to experiment with it and converting several classes to there was a converter that can convert Java file to Kotlin file. And I was getting excited. And like a few days later, I came to the founders and said, we're going to do our software development in Kotlin. And they looked at me and said, OK. And I would say, what? <laughs> That was the point that I'm saying, wow, that's great to be in a startup. And this could have turned to be a very bad decision, but at, the, at the, that point of time, it seems like a very calculated risk. So uh, Kotlin was released as 1.0 version and in February. There was quite a large adoption of the uh, Android development community. It seems to have very nice inter interoperability with Java language and the Java ecosystem, the Java uh, collections, and uh, it seems like a very nice uh, way to go. It had a lot of advanced features, and it had JetBrains backing it up, and I'm, I'm a great appreciator of JetBrains and what they do. IntelliJ IDEA is one of the best things that happened in the world. Um, so it was some kind of a calculated guess, but it was also a risk. So let's see what happened in the last uh, six years. So before that, this is my first commit. It is from May 16, almost six years ago. It named huge amount of changes. If some developer names its commit huge amount of changes now, I will be very upset, but back then, no standards, I could do anything. I was introducing Kotlin to our Maven uh, development uh, uh, build system and having a lot of things to put in place. And last February, some colleagues of mine discovered uh, this commit and commented on it, mocking me. So they said, not sure Kotlin is the way to go. Maybe you should use Go. Kotlin is just a layer of, on top of Java. I don't know what that's good for. There's already sealed classes in Java, blah, blah, blah. A lot of, of uh, making jokes on me. So what happens along the years? So we started with one developer, me. One year later, we were eight. Now we are 150. Kotlin developers in the company. None of them had Kotlin experience before. This is a very important point because uh, when company grows in such a quick pace, you don't have a lot of time, especially when you're a startup, to train everyone perfectly and make sure that they have all the things ready for them. And they need to, to some extent, get along on themselves. Okay, And the fact that we are in a very good position gives you an indication that moving from being a Java developer to a Kotlin developer is not a disaster. It's something that someone can do on its own. We've written 1.2 million lines of code in Kotlin, which is much larger than in, in Java. It will be much larger code base. And we moved from 1.02 to 1.0161 along the years. We actually adapted every Kotlin version that was uh, accept, uh, released, except the last one, which is 1.621. And also moved from the JVM of uh, Java 1.8 to Java 17 this year. So is it working? So basically, what happens is like that. We have over, th over 30 microservices running in production. It works flawlessly. We do have problems, but it's not related to Kotlin and the language. The onboarding of Java developers uh, is going smoothly and relatively quick, quickly someone from a Java background can go and develop in Kotlin. I think the IDE support is good. And also, uh, Kotlin plays very nicely with the tooling that we have in, in the JVM. Profilers, uh, debuggers, and everything else works very well. If someone has developed in JRuby, that didn't go very well if you needed to debug or profile something. 
Community, community addition, addition is growing. Actually, Kotlin is the, is the largest uh, adopted JVM language uh, after Java. Uh, along the way, Google adopted it as, as, a, as a preferred language for Android development. And it's basically also a very good selling point when you're trying to hire developers. If someone is doing Java for 10 years, Kotlin is very refreshing uh, to him or her. So basically, I think it's a huge success. So we can finish this talk and go to drink some coffee. But yet I want to discuss some things. So I'm going to talk about five Kotlin language features that I have some uh, thoughts about them and present them to you and maybe discuss it with you. And um, in order to do so, I, I need to give a short background on our technology stack. So this is our technology stack. Okay, got it? No, so I'll break it up. We are running on AWS. And we're using Kubernetes as our orchestrator. All our uh, microservices and pods are deployed with Kubernetes. We have CI CD pipelines, uh, uh, starting with Jenkins, uh, using Gradle to build everything, and JUnit to run unit test, integration test, component test, and all validation tests when we push code to production. We don't have QA in X insurance. On top of, of our uh, pods or Kubernetes, we are running JVM and runtime of Kotlin. And beside the runtime of Kotlin, we have a special use case that we will refer to in the future of the, this talk is Kotlin script. The ability to run uh, Kotlin scripts inside the, one of our microservices. This is the rating service, which is if you have a policy of insurance, you need to give it uh, the premium and the formula that gives the premium needs to be versioned and need to be uh, to be able to run concurrently all the versions at the same time. So we're actually creating package of, of Kotlin scripts which represents these formulas and we are able to consume them on the same time on the on our microservices. So we're also using Kotlin scripts in our code base. We are not using Spring. Spring Boot, any, any of that. We are using Drop Wizard, which is a, a microservices framework, an aggregator of Jetty as an application server, Jersey as doing REST, Jackson's realization of JSON, Logback for logging. Thanks God we are not using log for shell And JDBI um, as our uh, data access layer. We are also ju using Juice for uh, dependency injection. Was that a good decision? Not sure. Back then in 2016 seems like a reasonable. Maybe today Drop Wizard is getting backward and uh, Spring Boot is, uh, is becoming stronger and you have a lot of other frameworks uh, such as Ktor and Vertex and uh, Micronaut and a lot of other options that we didn't have the time or the energy to try to explore. Drop Wizard is working okay for us. Besides that, uh, our uh, database is RDS MySQL and we do migration of schema using Flyway. So that's basically our technology stack. There are additional stuff that are not relevant for this uh, talk. <coughs> so let's start with some optimism. The first language feature that I would like to, to discuss is data classes. And I think that it is an amazing, amazing feature. Okay. So it is widely used. We have over 6,000 data classes in our code base. We use them for the data transfer object, data access objects. We managed to resolve the serialization and deserialization very nicely, and I will show you how in a second. And the fact that we don't need to implement hash code equals getters, setters, uh, uh, destructuring, uh, and all this stuff makes the code very clean and concise. Also, the fact that we have the copy method helps us to write immutable code. So if you took on, take a look on this uh, data class, uh, address info, it has several members. All of them are final. Okay, val means final in Kotlin. And we have the telephone, the street, the city, the zip code, the number of the apartment or the, or the house, which is an int. 
In Kotlin, it translates into a primitive in this case, and we needed to take some special ca uh, care with it in terms of serialization. And the last field state is optional. And what we want to do when serialization is always easy, deserialization is, is a bit uh, awkward. What we want to have is that when we have an optional parameter in our data class, when we deserialize it and we don't have it in the JSON, we still want to put it as null. This enables us to make uh, changes in the API and uh, evolution of the API and add new fields and not be bothered whether they are specified by the clients or not. So basically everything that is nullable can be omitted from the JSON. We will see how we do that later on. There is another problem with JSON that primitive types, if they get null, can be set to a default value and we don't want that. We are also handling that as well. So, Jackson has an object mapper, and we are tweaking it by adding the mod Kotlin module. This is part of the Jackson ecosystem. It gives support for Kotlin. It doesn't ruin the support of what you need in Java, but it adds additional functionality that is needed in order, for example, to support the fact that uh, data classes are immutable, so you only have constructor, you don't have getter and setters and such. The second thing that we are doing is that we are setting the object mapper not to fail on unknown properties. This solves us with the missing uh, null, uh, nullable properties in, in the JSON. And the third thing that we are doing is we do want to fail on null from primitives. Okay, So we don't accept someone sending null for an int primitive. We want the deserialization to fail. So given all that, we are able to use the data class that we are, I showed you before, without any modifications in the code, no annotations, and able to serialize the serialize, send it between microservices, and all is working perfectly. So I'm happy with data classes and what happens with it, even if we are taking it into a larger scope. So now I will be a bit more pessimistic. Uh, Kotlin has null safety baked into its type system. And it is a very interesting feature because its promise is that it eliminates uh, the need to check for nulls and also eliminates null pointer exception from your system. So let's look at this example. There is a variable called versions. It's a map from string to string and we are using the get operator to get uh, the key of version ID and put in the for product version, which is a string. Do you know what's the problem with this? Will it compile? No. no. It will not compile because when you get from a map, you can get nulls. Okay? So if you want it to compile, you can either specify the product version as nullable type or you can use the double bang operator in order to, to make sure that it is null, it's not null and then you throw a null pointer exception when it does. So basically there is a possibility that there will be null pointer exception at this point, which is quite disappointing because we are using a very um, basic structure of, of any programming language and by using it we introduce NAS into our system. And the second problem is that when null pointer exception is thrown, it's after you pull the, the value from the map and you no longer know what the key that you are trying to use. So a better alternative will be to use require, which also takes things from the map, but if something goes wrong, it throws an, an exception with more meaningful description of what key was you trying to get from, the, from this. But if you look on the big picture, this is the rest of the function. So you see that you clear the nulls on the first line and then use it on the second and the third. If you wrote it in Java, you will not clear the null on the first line and it will be cleared on the second line because null pointer exception will be thrown, okay? So basically you didn't gain much with this code that's written here in terms of null safety. 
It's very similar to what would happen in Java. And this is make me thinking that there is something missing here. We have over 11,000 uh, invocation of the operator that throws null pointer exception in our code. This means that probably we are doing something wrong, okay? So in order to get the benefits of the null safety, you probably need more structure to be more rigorous and to try to understand where and how you can clean at least part of the codes and make safe zones in the code where nulls are not introduced. And this is not very easy, okay? The language doesn't help you, the tooling doesn't help you. You cannot specify that I'm here in a place that nulls cannot enter, you shall not pass, okay? But you need to develop this knowledge and these methodologies by yourself. It's not that easy. So it's not that I'm saying that uh, null safety is a failure, but I say that it is harder than it seems to get it right. Okay? And I think that probably we are not doing the best job in using it. So that's about null safety. Let's move on. Back to optimism. Do you know what is, what's this? Anyone ever seen this? Okay, good for you. <laughs> That's the spaceship operator, okay? It comes from Scala, I think Scala Z library, and it signifies something. I probably read it a few times, I don't remember what it does, and I probably never will. And it's an example how if a programming language feature can be <laughs> extremely abused to a point that it becomes harmful instead of useful. So operators overloading in some languages give too much power to the developer in such a way they can create these kind of weird uh, operators and doesn't help with the readability of the code. On the other hand, in Kotlin, I think the developers of the language made a very good job. They limited this feature to the bare minimum. So if you want to to do operator overloading, it can be on a set of very closed group of operators like plus, minus, get, invoke, etc., like 10 or 12 or something like that, different operators. And you need to give the function a name that mean, give it the meaning. So if you want to use the plus operator, you have operator fun plus, which, which hints the developer, don't do whatever you want. <laughs> this function means something. You are summing two things. You cannot use it for every, everything that you like. And I looked before the, the presentation or on our code base on all our operator overloading, and we actually have 155 instances of this. And they actually make sense. We use them in financial attribution when we need to sum it up. We're using it when we have answers to questions and we want to aggregate them together and in, um, in other places that it makes sense to do these operations. So if we take a look on this feature, which has a lot of potential to create a damage, it didn't create any damage and it's actually beneficial for our organization to use it. So plus one for uh, operator overloading and how it implemented in Kotlin. So let's go back to pessimism. Yeah, I'm taking you up and, high, up and down like in a very uh, rough terrain. Extension functions. So extension function is an amazing feature of Kotlin. It enables the, the, the language to extend functionality of classes that cannot be changed. Part of them part, are part of the JRE. For example, mutable list, adding a function swap, which might be useful for some of the use cases, is extremely useful. It's a syntactic sugar that makes your life easier and makes you think that you have extra functionality on object when actually you have a static method that is imitating the behavior of object orientation. But can it be used in a wrong way? So actually, I think yes. 
And the f I think the first problem is that the Kotlin documentation is actually encouraging using uh, extension functions in places that personally I believe it's incorrect. So if you took on uh, this extension function, we are something taken from our code. We are extending the, ob the, the class of string with an extension function, and this is the function, is version lower than. Okay, so we have a version that it is a string, and another version that it is a string, and you want to compare between them. But this is not an operation on string. This doesn't make sense to me. So when the developer wrote it, he thought that probably this is a good idea because he, in the context of what he was doing, it made sense, okay? I'm not saying that something was wrong from the eye of the developer. And moreover, it's private, so it's limited to this class. But does it improve the readability? I don't think so, because if you have a guest looking at this, he's seeing a method on string that it doesn't make sense and it doesn't, he doesn't expect it, okay? So this is a bit problematic, like it's, taking a feature and using it in a place that it impairs readability and cause actually more problems than solutions. And this is only a very mild example, but we also have this, okay? Not exactly the same functions, but we have extension functions that are developed in some of the classes that, are, that can be exported to other places and make mess in our code base to people that are not familiar with it. So if someone is very familiar with the code, you can say, okay, that's great. I know what it does. It makes sense in my context, but for different contexts, it doesn't make sense. Personally, I think that extension functions should be limited to something that is common to the organization, some kind of an infrastructure that makes sense. And we see good examples of usages of extension functions later on. We also, so in that case, I will do the simple thing. I will just add the private function, is version lower than, gets two parameters, this version and that version, and that's all. Less, uh, um, using, using less features and more simple way to do the same thing, and I think it's much better. We even see these things in the, in the, in the code. Someone is developing a data class, and the later and uh, the line after that is adding an extension function to this data class, and on it could be done differently, right? You can just add a member function to this data class. Okay, there is no need to introduce an extension function. None of the benefits that you get from extension functions is valid here. Okay. I think that in the future we will start, we are, we are using detect, uh, which is some kind of uh, validation of code and to introduce some rules that will limit extension functions in our code because I think that it is overused. So that's my take on extension function. Dangerous, okay? Look, if you have a lot of developer, make sure that they don't overuse it and take it to a wrong direction. Next, I'm going to talk about concurrency. And we said that we are using drop wizard, which means that we are using Jetty, which means that we are not using any asynchronous model like Netty and stuff. And we have Jetty, which has worker threads, and we also have thread pools for asynchronous operations. And we are very fanatic of maintaining a context. Why is it so? We are doing transaction tracing. We want to be able to follow a transaction across all our microservices. This is done both in um, open tracing, Jaeger, but also our, all our logs have transactions ID in them. So when we are sending a request, we put a header on the, on the request with the context and all these fields. And then with the serialize, we put it on the MDC of, uh, of, of logback or SLF4J. And this M MDC is is then populated to other threads on every asynchronous call that we are doing, okay? So, and we are actually very strict on making sure that it gets everywhere. 
So if, for example, we, want, we have an executor and we want to execute a task on a thread pool, what we will do is we will not allow to use the function execute. We created an extension function, which is good because it's our infrastructure, okay, which is called execute with context. And it's implemented that way. We are taking the MDC out. We are taking the, the data from the MDC and we create a new runnable that wraps the original runnable and populate it back and also populate the tracing information for open tracing. Okay, and then we execute the new runnable. So the context is maintained, it's passed to the new thread. So that's what we do with general, with uh, normal Java constructs. But we also do it with coroutines, and this requires some kind of adaptations. So on coroutines, we have launch, we have async, we have run blocking, we have flow on, and some other constructs. But the nice thing is that they are having actually three parameters passed to them, and some of them are default. There is the coroutine context, the coroutine start, and the block that you're actually running. And there is also a class that is called MDC context, which implementing the coroutine context uh, interface or superclass. And what we are doing, this is operator overloading of the context, by the way, we are populating, we are adding the MDC context to the context of the coroutine. And in that way, we are passing it by to the asynchronous execution that is happening behind the scenes when you're using coroutines. So this is actually working for us. And my only take on that, and we implemented it on all the methods of the coroutine library, and my only take on that, that maybe it could be nice if someone could set the context in a generic way that maybe we can set the default way of entering the context, and then we can use launch and uh, async and all the original uh, methods that we have in the coroutine library without needing to extend them with new functions of our own. So that's my take on concurrency. Next, I'm going to be pessimistic again and go back to type aliases. And this is something that I don't really like. So what is type aliasing? It's uh, giving alternative names to existing types, and such if you have a set of node work, uh, you can call it node set, but it is a bit problematic. And it, cre it created some kind of, of uh, weird pattern of development in our company that we have like a class with 50 different type aliases of 50 different, over 50, uh, different uh, sort of classes which are actually primitives. And why it is problematic? First of all, that's not me only here, this is controversial and there are articles written about type aliases and it's problem problems, but let's try to explore, explore, it, explore it a bit further. So first of all, type aliases are not safe. The fact that you have zip code, which is a string, and address, which is a string, doesn't mean that the compiler will block you from assigning a zip code to that address. So you didn't, if, you didn't benefit from it at all, okay? And so that's a problem, but that's a compiler problem. Maybe it can solve somehow. But I don't think that it even gives even real value in some cases. So let's look on some class response. It is a class that returns a response for a microservice, and it has a member of success and a member of response <coughs> message. Can you guess what are the types of these members? Yeah, Boolean string, but I didn't guess it when I looked at it because there is a type alias of success equals Boolean, response message equals string. Which inf what information does it add to you? Is it adding anything? The member is already success. The member is already response message. What you really want to know 
is what is underlying for this, and this is actually obscuring the, um, the actual type that you are using. If I would rewrite it now, I will do this instead. This is much clearer. It doesn't hide the information that you really need in order to understand the code. Okay, it doesn't add magic to it. There is another problem. It relates to deprecation. If you deprecate a class, like the class deprecate me, then you will get uh, indication in the IDE, okay? Uh, and it will mark it uh, with a strike through line and it will be angry on you and you get warning in compilation. But if you use type alias, that will not happen. You are, if you alias it with I'm not deprecated and I like it, then you can use it everywhere you know, want and no one will notice that there is a problem here, okay? There are actually some good news, uh, good uses of uh, type aliases in our code, uh, like instead of list of pair of OTP validation response, digit password data, we're using validation results, which is shortening the code and in improves the readability. And also, instead of writing list of array of string and array of string, row and string matrix are making more sense. So, in general, there are good users to type aliases, but it can be misused by developers and uh, it is, can turn to be problematic in a large scale software development. What can we do, you do instead? Basically, there are value classes, or, or we call inline classes in Kotlin, and you can use them instead of type aliases, and you can put like the expression string into ni jexl expression, which is actually type safe at compilation time and sort of erased at runtime. And this is actually much better, okay? Because it does give you some kind of a type safety when you need it while maintaining sort of primitive type at runtime and reducing the overhead of what's happening here. The problem with that is that migration is not easy. You need to make uh, some kind of uh, monolithic change in a lot of places in one time. Sometimes these, are, these types are used in multiple microservices, so you need to change everything at once, otherwise it doesn't work. And not that easy to migrate from type aliases to inline classes. And we also have a problem with using inline classes in serialization of our current Jackson version, which will be solved as we will move to the new drop wizard version that was released, I think, on Sunday. So this problem is solved, but right now we are not able to use inline classes as we want. So, that were five uh, language features that I, was wa I wanted to talk with you about them. I also want to talk about migration, okay? Because when we started uh, Next Insurance, we were using Kotlin 0 0.2, 0, 1.02, and it didn't support bytecode generation of Java 8. So, and the, in this time we were using like Java 8 and, and Kotlin at the same time because we didn't fully move everything. And uh, I really wanted it to be able to support it and Java and Kotlin 1.10 was supporting it. We move it as soon as possible. And since then we, we migrated Kotlin to every new version that was released very quickly. What we didn't do, we didn't migrate our Java platform. We stayed on Java 8 mainly because at the beginning we used Elastic Beanstalk in AWS and it supported only Java 8. So it was possible for us to move to a newer version of Java only after we finished the migration to Kubernetes. When we dockerize our JVMs, we can use every JVM version that we want. So the first migration was done a bit over a year ago, uh, migrating into Java 11 from uh, Java 8. But I would like to discuss uh, the migration to Java 17 that was done in September. So before the migration, we were in a situation that we were using 
um, Java 11, and we later on upgraded to the JRE and runtime of uh, Java 16. Mainly, we didn't need any language feature of Java, but we wanted the performance benefits, improvements in garbage collection that were introduced in Java 15 and Java 16. So we did upgrade our runtime to Java 16. But we are still, uh, and, and you should differentiate between what happens in the runtime and what happens in the build time. In the build time, we were still building the bytecode to, uh, um, to version 11, okay? And our libraries were using at the end state uh, Kotlin version 1.5.21, and, and the language level was 1.4. And we also use Gradle with the Kotlin dialect, so it means that Gradle comes with Kotlin of itself and it has its version of its own. And we had some difficulties uh, during the migration. First of all, uh, when Java 17 was released, Kotlin was not supporting the bytecode version, so we couldn't use the latest bytecode version. It took some time until Kotlin 1.6 was released in order to be able to use uh, Java 17 bytecode version. And this is a problem that we probably will happen with every migration to new version. It's not that critical if you're only using Kotlin, but if you have a project that mixed between Java and Kotlin, then it means that you will not be able to use the new language, Java, the language of Java version with the same compiler and everything. You probably need to find a way to differentiate between them. The second thing is that Gradle was not supporting Java 17 and the latest version of Kotlin, so we had to wait a bit for, uh, for it to be able to support it. But we have some other issues. Uh, do you remember the Kotlin scripts that we use on our rating formulas? We actually used several methods uh, that were deprecated in the language level of 1.5. We're using it all, 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 all over. It actually makes sense. The function min, max, min, by, and max, by is only terrible, which are extension function. We're renamed to min or null because they are nullable types. Okay, so it, calling it min, it doesn't comply with the way Kotlin is doing things. Okay, if it can return null, it should be min or null. So it was deprecated in 1.4, but it's errors in one in error since 1.5, so we needed to change our code. But we, are ha we have all these formulas deployed to AWS S3. We cannot change them. So we had some kind of a problem that we got stuck and couldn't upgrade to the new version of Kotlin because it will not work. So we actually needed to add this method manually and later on develop a mechanism that will enable us to uh, resend our packages to production uh, uh, with some kind of an infrastructure because we expect that this will happen again in the future. It is a bit naive approach to think that if you have a Kotlin script that it can run with any ver future version of Kotlin. Okay, So we, we were able to avoid it now, but I'm afraid that it will happen again. Another thing that we have a problem with, and I'm putting an X on it because we still don't have a good solution. And I was sitting yesterday with one of the Gradle experts in the conference and we were starting to find a better solution, but our Gradle project is a bit of a mess. And since we're using Gradle for both uh, our Kotlin dialect of, of, of our build scripts, and also for compiling our Kotlin code, we are sort of bound to the same version. And this is bad. We don't want to have the same version of Gradle because if a new version of Kotlin goes out, we cannot use it until Gradle uses it. And Kotlin right now, a uh, Gradle right now uses uh, Kotlin version 1.531. So we needed to tweak somehow the build system in order to enable us to detach from the version of used by Gradle and the version that we want to use. And we made it in so, sort of a hacky way. If you experience that as well, uh, I will be happy to hear your solution. 
I hope that we will have a better one. I just put an X on what we have because that's not the way to do it. So the situation right now is that we have Java 17. We didn't bother to move to Java 18. It doesn't give us any benefits, but probably Java 19 will be our next step. Uh, Gradle 7.4 uh, with Kotlin 1.531 bundled, compiling to Java, uh, to Kotlin language level 1.6, uh, library and running on Kotlin 1.610. Okay, we didn't migrate yet. I, at least not to my knowledge, uh, to Kotlin 1.621, which is the latest version. So that is all I have for you today. And I have four minutes for questions. So if you have anything that you want to discuss or hate what I said, now it's the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, the question was, we started using Maven and moved to Gradle along the way. Yes, we moved to Gradle like a year and a half ago. Uh, we were sort of hoping that it will improve our uh, velocity, okay? Um, Gradle was developing a lot of features that uh, support caching and uh, larger scale projects. And it did improve but not as we expected. It was a very large project, took us a lot of time to, to complete. And we are still not Gradle experts. Okay, I, I feel more comfortable with the ugly uh, XML files of, of Maven than the freestyle Maven, uh, Gradle files. But uh, we're improving there. Yeah. Kotlin and JetBrains strong connection. I, I actually don't think that uh, JetBrains is a Russian company at per se. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It's a bit problematic, but uh, personally, I think that technologies shouldn't be involved with politics. The language is open source, free, free to use. Um, JetBrains is a wonderful company, and I'm not sure they are supporters of, of the invasion to Ukraine. Does it answer a question or? or <laughs> it doesn't really answer the question on security implications. It's more an answer to political. Yeah, so, so you're talking about security? I think security implications is a different question for us. Well, why is it a security issue? Mm. It's open source, you can. E I think it's possibility for any open source that you're using. Someone can very easily tweak uh, some of the th third parties and even know, don't even know it until some kind of a security uh, expert unveils it maybe years later. So uh, personally, I'm not concerned. Yeah. So I think that several things would have changed. I, I don't think it will be dramatic, but in some sense it will be. It was easier to recruit developers. They were very enthusiastic to get into the, into the language and into the platform. And uh, it was some kind of, wow, that's amazing, okay? And when you have enthusiastic uh, developers, they, they move faster, okay? 
So that's one thing. I think that uh, some of the contracts in the language are improving their code readability. They are improving the, the the amount of code you need to to write. And Java has a lot of boilerplate that you can avoid in Kotlin. Is it a life changer? I'm not sure, but it's a lot of small things that can help you do better. Yeah. I will definitely choose Kotlin today. I don't know what I will do <coughs> five years from now. Maybe Java will catch up, but it's still not there. Yeah. Uh, I want to add to the previous question. Like if, but if you would decide not be between Java and Kotlin, but like from everything you want to pick, would you still pick Kotlin? That, that's a very hard question, because I think that the platform that you're using uh, is re should be somehow related to the skill set of the developers. I think that Go is a viable platform. I think that uh, Rust is a viable fa platform for other usages. Okay. Um, I will not say what I think about Node.js and JavaScript, but essentially you can build, definitely can build things with it. Okay. Uh, I think that the tooling of a lot of platforms are not even comparable to what you have in, in Java and the JVM. When you need to profile, we need to debug, you need to understand, you need what's going on. You can do it much faster and much more efficiently with tools that are extremely better than other platforms. Um, but you can do every software if you have skilled engineers in any language, even assembly. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Can you stop here? Thank you.